Revelation this morning, and uh, it's uh, good to have you with us. This chart that you have uh, will show you the intent of the book of Revelation as it relates to your body. And the town that we are dealing with this morning in the book of Revelation is the town of Smyrna, and the ancient Hindu city that is attached to that, as you can see, is Ahath. Adhistana, which is the sexual area, the prostate area. The sign is Sagittarius. It is a symbol, the area of desire and sex. And the planet is Jupiter. Um, th what's interesting about that, too, the planet being Jupiter, is at this point in the age, the planet Jupiter is moving out as the controlling force in this new age, being replaced by the planet Uranus, which is planet spirit. So as you can see, that even uh, from a standpoint of cosmic proportions, the area of desire is being replaced by that which is spirit. Um, it's, you know, one of the things I think that people have trouble with, there really is no such thing as spirit. Okay? That, that you should arrive at a conclusion. There is no such thing. Spirit is just something that is real that you can't see. And that actually is a motivation or electrical energy which comes from the human brain that is basically an untapped resource. You call it spirit uh, because you don't know where it comes from. But it's, it's a real physical, logical thing inside of yourself. Uh, the movement of uh, the uh, electromagnetic fields that come from cosmic uh, things such as planets and so forth that affect the magnets, the crystal magnets in the brain, we call that spirit. But it's a very common electrical thing. Um, if you wanted to make something holy out of electricity, you could say, well, that's the Holy Spirit and light comes on and so forth and so on. The only reason we don't do that is because you can see it. But there are proportions that you can't see that are there. Uh, for instance, if, uh, there's, there's a whistle that can be blown at such a high pitch that very few people can hear it. Well, that doesn't mean it, it wasn't blown and it didn't make a sound. It was just that the majority of people can't hear it. That doesn't make it spirit. So spirit's a word we give for things we don't understand. Miracles are just things that haven't happened yet. Once something happens and it's no longer a miracle, you go on looking for something else to be the miracle. And basically, that's, that's what life is. Life is real. There's a reality to it. If God is in existence, then it should be explainable. If you can't explain it, it doesn't exist. And God is an explainable thing. And we're going to show you some things in the book of Revelation that are extremely explainable and ex extremely real. But as you see here, the way the book of Revelation was set up, and you trace this back through the ancients of Buddha and Krishna and through Christ, is that it was done very, uh, very uh, real, uh, aligning everything to the human body. The pineal gland of the brain, the head, the throat, the heart, the solar plexus, the sexual area, and the sacrum. And of course, uh, you're lucky because today we're doing the sexual area, so I guess that's why there's a few more people on the 5th of July or whatever. Okay? All right. Where we were last week, or last time that we discussed the book of Revelation, we entered to the town of Smyrna, okay? Now, the town of Smyrna is related to, if you go across the line, to the sexual area, and why? Because if you look on the back of the page at the top, number two, Smyrna was the center of a fig industry. And in the ancients, the fig was used in mythology as a phallic symbol, the male sexual organ. It means the, the fig was a symbol of that organ. And so Smyrna became uh, a town that had sexual implications. And thus, uh, Smyrna becomes that area which relates to the sexual area of the body. That's basically all it is. And it's, as you know, very real. If you've checked lately, you'll find out that, yes, indeed, it does exist. And uh, yes, indeed. These desires and these feelings exist. It's not spiritual. It's not hocus pocus. It's real. So we reduce everything to an extremely real uh, uh, basis. And then if you'll follow this track, you can actually bring that which you call God into a reality. It actually exists when you understand what it is. If you stop referring to God as him and start referring to God as it, you can come in contact very, very quickly. Because as Jesus Christ says, it's within you. It is within you, and you can find it within you, and everything that you need is within you. There was a television program we were watching the other evening of a man whose leg, uh, legs were going to be amputated. In fact, he was, his leg was supposed to be amputated the very next day. And they brought this guy in, and the mother said, well, I don't believe in this kind of stuff. But we figured, what the heck, uh, what have we got to lose? Because they were taking his leg off the next day. So that evening, they brought in this guy, and he says to the fellow, he says, look, 
and there's no need to take your leg off because everything you need to heal that leg is inside of you. And they started, and they started uh, a holistic approach, and he started laying hands on, raising just above the level of the area. Make a long story short, uh, this guy whose legs were coming off, who was in a wheelchair with his legs shriveled up like two little pins, uh, eventually walked, and the doctor came on the television and said, when I saw him take a step, I passed out. He said, because it was absolutely impossible. Bone grew where there was no bone, skin, all of this stuff happened. How? Miracles? Absolutely not. It's the capacity within the human psyche to do these things, but you just have not told, been told by anybody that you can. Jesus Christ said, you're the, the light of the world. The kingdom is within you. The things that he does, you can do. But we've chose to follow religion which says, no, you're a, you're a scuzzball, a slobbering sinner, and you come in here on your knees and sign a card, you'll be all right. You know? And when will you be all right? Well, after you die. Well, <laughs> you know, and we fell for it. Instead of understanding that everything that you need is built within you, built within the mechanism of your body and your mind to do these things, if you'll begin to understand it, and just like we say, you know, here we have a light bulb, okay? When the light bulb burns out, you get a new light bulb. You screw it into the same power, the same light comes back. That's what you are. You live inside of a light bulb. You're the light inside of the light bulb. When your light bulb burns out, they just give you a new light bulb, screw you right back into the power, and off you go, because it's the same light. It always, it, sometimes you say, oh, the light burned out in the bathroom. No, the light did not burn out in the bathroom. The light bulb burned out in the bathroom. You put a new bulb in, you got the light again. And when they say, somebody died. No, somebody did not die. Their light bulb died, but they put a new bulb on them, screw them back in, and there they are again. And that's just, that just is all there is to it. It's a very, very simple procedure. But we make it into a spiritual thing of hocus pocus and we sing songs and we don't understand what the heck we're talking about we don't believe any of it but we sing about it and we come in and we give them money and we shut up and we go on to church and people come out in robes and funny looking hats and we say oh this is holy we don't know why what is this and there we go and we've missed the whole thing and life has passed us by because we never settled down to begin to understand what the heck is it all about so we'll show you in, in some ways looking at the book of Revelation, which is actually comes out of ancient Buddhist and Hindu scriptures from the most ancient times, and is filled with symbolism. Now, you can never take the Bible or any other document of this type unless you have authority. Psalm 78, 2, God speaks in parables. Proverbs 1, 6, wisdom is understanding dark sayings. Galatians 4.24, the Old Testament is an allegory. Mark 4.34, Jesus never taught but in a parable. The Apostle Paul, be not a minister of the letter because the letter kills. Don't take this stuff literally. Begin to understand it maturely. And then it'll talk to you and you'll start to discover within yourself the mechanism to turn on this thing which is called, or which we call, God. We got to Smyrna, okay? And if you turn open to page 1003, if you just look at the... And those little Bibles, if you'll just look at the top of the page when I yell it out, you'll get there real quickly. Um, and, and you'll be right where we should be. If you look at page 1003, you're at Revelation 2 and verse 8. Revelation chapter 2 and verse 8. And unto the angel of the church in Smyrna write these things, said the first and the last which was dead and is alive. Now look at if you look at the chart, as you see, Smyrna is Hithana, it's the sexual area. It is the starting point of the two witnesses, okay? Now, this is known very well by the ancients of, uh, uh, of India and, and the Buddha culture of the ancient Chaldeans. The two witnesses are called Ida and Pingala, and they relate in your terms to two aspects of your brain, which are called the pineal gland and the pituitary. In other words, when you begin to understand this, you set into action the pineal gland and the pituitary gland, you set into action the two witnesses. They're part of your body. They're not, they're not something that doesn't exist. Let me show you. Now, here, as we start this, and let me, let me give you a basis. In biblical mysticism, the number nine means human consciousness. Biblical mysticism. It comes from the Sanskrit value of the word Adam, which has a numerical value of nine. You have to take my word for it, but you can look it up. And so you will see nine follows through throughout the entire scripture 
as a number that means human consciousness, the human mind. And you're able to break into some very interesting codes, okay? Now, when we talk about the two witnesses, how would we be able to come up with the breaking the code of the Bible to realize that these two witnesses relate to that which is the human mind? Let me show you how it's done. If you'll go to page 1008 and you'll come up to Revelation 11 and verse 3. Everybody there. And I will give power unto my two witnesses. There they are. And they shall prophesy 1,203 score. A score is 20. So three score is 60. 1,260 days. Okay? Now, the way that this works, so that you understand this, one is God, two is you and God, six is the end of that which is works or those things that you do. One God, two you and God, six are the efforts that you put into making this work. And what, comes, what happens is it comes out to the number nine. One plus two equals three, six equals nine. And so, and so what they're talking about here is consciousness. The two witnesses are consciousness. We'll prophesy 1,260 days. Go on to the next chapter and look at the book of Revelation, chapter 12, okay? Now go to verse 6, and we'll show you something. And the woman fled into the wilderness where she has a place prepared of God that they shall feed her a thousand, two hundred, and threescore days. Okay? That's not. Now who's the woman? In mysticism, the woman means the spirit. In this particular place, it's your human spirit. And the woman, or your spirit, flees into the wilderness, which is meditation, where she has a place prepared for her. Where she Now, what this is telling you here, this 1,260 equals 9, simply means this is consciousness. Number 9 is consciousness. In other words, it's telling you this is the mind. The woman is the human spirit. When the human spirit flees into that area of leaving that which is the lower consciousness, moving that which is into the deep meditative state of consciousness, there she will be fed. Okay? Now it says something here. Look what it says here. And the woman fled into the wilderness where she has a place prepared of God. Okay? Look at page 880 in the Bible. And the rest of you go to John chapter 14. John chapter 14, page 880. And look at verse 2. Let's see where the place is prepared. Here's where Jesus starts talking astrologically. In my Father's house, which is the solar zodiac, or many mansions, which is the zo uh, lunar zodiac, if it were not so, I would have told you, I go to prepare a place for you, and if I go and prepare a place, I will come again and receive you, that you, where I am, there you may be also. So here Jesus is talking about preparing that place. It says the woman had the place prepared for her. 1,260 identifies the number 9. Okay? So here is the place. Then you say, I go to prepare a place for you, that where I am you may be also. So where is he? Look. Just turn the page right over, or go to uh, John chapter 14, verse 20. It's right on the next page, we're on the same page. Here's where Jesus identifies the place where he will be, that you may be also. At that day you shall know that I am in my Father, you in me, and I in you. There's the place. The place is prepared for you. The place is the temple at the right hemisphere of the brain. The place is that holy place which is consciousness. Okay? Using and understanding that number of consciousness being number nine. See? I'm going to show you another reason why it, it, you know, it comes out to 1,260 and how actually they started this thing. What you do is you take the 30 days in the, in, in the month, the 30 degrees in each of the, the zodiacal signs, and um, you have 12 signs is 360 degrees. Okay? There's 360 degrees in that which is the uh, zodiac. Okay? Now, if you take... Uh, th 30 times 300, uh, you know, I forgot how to do this. Okay, 30 times 360 degrees, 1,080, and then they take one half of that times the 360 degrees, which is 180, which is the 1,260. And basically, that's, that's how you arrive at that, and that was the first introduction of that type of use of numerology into the Bible. It's based on the zodiac, the 12 signs of the zodiac and the 30 degrees of the zodiac. Okay, now, here is what I wanted to show you. 
using this number nine, you're able to break codes in the Bible. Go to Revelation uh, 13. It's on page uh, 1010, 1010. Revelation 13, verse 18. Now here we'll be able to break a code of the Bible, and you'll be able to understand something. It says, here is wisdom, let him that hath understanding count the number of the beast, for it is the number of a man. His number is six hundred, three score, and six. That's six, six, six. Six hundred, three score, and six. Now let's break the code on the basis of that number that we know. Six plus six plus six equals one eight. One plus eight is nine. Who's the beast? You go into the men's room or the ladies' room, whichever is your preference, and there is a picture of the beast hanging right over the sink when you turn the light on. See the beast. That's the lower mind, is the beast. Now look in the very, very next, the very, very next line, what does it say? And I looked, and lo, a lamb stood on the Mount Zion, and with him 144,000. This is salvation, those who are saved. One plus four plus four, nine. Okay, so there you have it. That which is saved is the higher mind, that which is the beast is the lower mind. This is all consciousness. And I'll show you a very interesting thing when you want to look at If you go to page 766 now, I'll let you break the code on your own, and uh, I'll let you do it by yourself so that I won't have to do it for you, because this is then your reading or learning how to understand what the Bible really means. See, so all of these things are put in there for a purpose, and they have a meaning for you. Now look at John, you're in page, uh, what did I say, 766? No, that's, that's wrong. <laughs> uh, I'm not sure what page now, but go to John 21. Somebody tell me what page John 21 is. 766 would be wrong. John 21, 21st chapter of the book of John. 886. Okay, so page 886. So let's take, now this is the one you figure out. This is the one that you, you, you break the code. I think uh, we've taught a little bit here. You begin to understand how the Bible is talking about consciousness. You see if you can break the code, all right? Here we are, John chapter 21. I want you to look at verse 6. And Jesus is teaching them how to catch fish. And what does he say? Cast your net on the right side of the ship and you shall find. You see that? Cast your net on the right side of the ship and you shall find. Well, how do we know that he's not talking about a ship? How do we know that he's not talking about fish? How do we know that he's not talking about water? Because the code enters into this and explains to you who are looking and who are seeking mystically for an answer Go to John chapter 21, verse 11, and let's read it and take a look at it right together. Simon Peter went up, drew up the net to land full of great fish. How many fish did he catch? 153. Add them up. 1 plus 5 plus 3 equals... There you go. And so here what Jesus is saying, if you want to understand, what is fish? Bring food. Your mother always tells you that. You want to have wisdom. You want to have understanding. You want to have enlightenment. Cast your energy to the right side and you'll find. And it says that they pulled up 153, which means the right hemisphere becomes enlightened. You begin to understand your purpose. You begin to understand why you're on the planet. Yeah, you know, Take a look at it. Here, here you're sitting here looking at me, trying to figure out what the heck are you doing here? You've been going to church all of your life trying to find out why you're here. Look here. What is this for? To write on. This is to erase it. What's this? It's a speaker. What does it do? It makes the music. Here's a decoration tree. What is this for? It holds the messages. What's the rope for? The decoration. Look at the chair here. The chair's to sit on. Look at the, even the screws in the chair. You know that the screws in the chair are in there to hold the chair together. Now what I want you to do, the ultimate creation. Stop for just a second. Now turn and look to the person sitting next to you. Quick. For what? And nobody knows. You know what every single item down to a screw in this room is for, but you look at each other and you have no idea. Why? Because nobody ever stopped to tell you. Because they don't want you to know what you're for. Because if you begin to know what you're for, then you'll realize you don't need them. And you don't have to live in the world of the collective consciousness that depends on groups of churches or organizations or systems to hold you in the bondage and to keep you that way on the basis of a lie. We were watching the movie last night, JFK, if you saw that. And Garrison, at the point of closing his argument in court, said, you know what, the bigger the lie, the more people will believe it. The biggest lie that has ever been perpetuated on the people in this universe is religion. Absolute lie. 
and people flock to it. And what's the purpose of the lie? Collective consciousness. Get you to shut up, dole out your money, don't ask any questions, and let them do the thinking for you. You're worthless, you're no good, you have nothing to say, get on your knees and ask for pity, and give us your money, we'll tell you what songs to sing, don't express yourself, don't read any of those books, don't talk to any of those people, stay away from them, stay with us, and we'll save you, and when you die, good things will happen. It's a lie. And then there was a Jesus Christ, and it wouldn't serve the people of the world unless God satisfied his ego by torturing this guy to death. And we love it that way. This God that you're following and bending your knees has such an ego that the only way he could get his ego satisfied was torturing a young man to death. How about the fact that Jesus Christ was tortured to death by the religious because he was about to bring them crashing to their knees? Because he said... These temples aren't worth standing on top of one another. The kingdom of God is within you. How about it? Is this same God who, who tortured this young man to death is going to wrap it all up by dropping atomic bombs on you? Armageddon! He's not going to be satisfied unless he wipes every one of you out. Armageddon. Oh, great. You want to follow this guy? Come to church. This is the guy you're coming to church to hear what he's got to say. I don't want to hear what he's got to say. And Jesus is coming again. God says to Jesus, hey, it's time to come back. He said, are you kidding me? <laughs> no way. I don't think so. Oh, but you see what happened the first time? Read the book. <laughs> Where, is he? Where is he? Where would you be? I'd be on a train going the other way. What did Jesus say? Jesus says, the kingdom comes not with observation. The kingdom is within you. You want to find me, look within yourself. And yet we bought it. Bought the whole thing. Come troop from the church and this violent God that slaughters people, that's going to destroy people, that scares the hell out of little kids with telling them about devils and demons and hells and all of this junk that doesn't exist. Doesn't exist. We created it all. Made it all up to scare people. There is no devil. There is no hell. There is no demons. But we had to make something up to scare people, to keep them in line. We did. Did a good job, too, because they all come flocking to church, especially the churches that say you're going to hell if you don't come. Boy, they all show up. They're scared. Maybe it's true. I don't know. Why. Where am I going? I, uh... And all the heavens that they're going to live in, where are they? Someplace else, not around here. All got to live and got to leave here. So they hope they write gospel songs. I'm going to leave this old rotten, miserable world. I'm going up on yonder. I'm going to meet my Lord. I'm going to meet Jesus in the air somewhere. Get the hell out of here. I'm going to meet Jesus. Oh, yeah, I can't wait to go. And so what happens? They pollute everything. Why? Religion told them this is a dump. No good here. Going to go someplace. Where? The moon? Mars? Jupiter? Where are they going to go? They're going to go in no place to go, but they're going to go. And they're going to make a mess out of this. It's a bus stop, see? And in the meantime, what happens? All the kids are on drugs, committing suicide, starving to death, dropping bombs on one another, machine gunning each other in the streets forever. Never stopped. And they're all saying, they're all in the church today saying, amazing grace, how sweet the sound. And they got stained glass on the window so they don't have to look outside and see what a mess is out. They're all outside shooting each other, drugging each other, screaming at one another, lining up to doctors for all kinds of tranquilizers. They gotta have tranquilizers so they can go to church and be tranquil. <laughs> go, oh, I got I gotta get my kid to college. Oh, we gotta go to college so he can grow up and have a psychiatrist, just like dad. How's he gonna afford a psychiatrist like I have? Unless he go. Because they have robbed and raped and pillaged the people. And who knows? Nobody knows. Just keep going in, keep your mouth shut, do what they say, and everything's going to be okay. When? After you die. You got to die first. How would you like this? This would be great. Here, I got a beautiful house for you. It's on the uh, ocean front. On the ocean front, and I will let you have it for 400 a month. 400 a month, 
And all you do is send me a check for 400 a month, and then after you die, it is yours. <laughs> oh, you laugh, but that's exactly what religion has said. Give me all your money, and after you die, you're going to go to some nice place. No, I don't think so. Jesus Christ said God is the God of the living, not of the dead. You get yours now. You find out what it's about now. You find out why is 90% of your brain dormant. Why does 90% of your brain interact in a different mode? It doesn't act in a mode that you can... Why? Why is it only 10% that you use? And when you begin to explore the 10% that you use, you know what you'll understand? What tithing is all about. It has nothing to do with giving your money. Can you imagine grown people, doctors, lawyers, engineers, they give these people 10% of their money. For what? Well, for God's work. And the guys are in jail. Or they're on television. And if they, you want to give 10%, they take credit cards. If you don't have a MasterCard, you cannot get healed or go to heaven. Get MasterCard. They don't accept. Maybe they won't accept discovery. No, you can't get healed unless you have MasterCard or e What's the other one? MasterCard or Visa. Ain't got time. Yeah, American Express. Well, we take American Express, but you don't take carte blanche. You can't get healed if you have carte blanche. You've got to have American Express. But you know, the point is, you, 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 buy, you buy, we buy it also. This is true. This is true. So why you go to heaven. Okay. But if you will take and understand tithing is the 10%, which is the left side of your brain, the carnal side, then you'll get into meditation. When you shut that down, you're tithing. And when you shut the left side down, you turn the right side on. You have then cast your net to the right side, and you'll find the fish. You'll find the wisdom. You'll find the understanding. How do you know unless you try it? You're thinking with 10% of your brain, wonder if everything's screwed up. What if you drove your car when you pulled three of the spark plugs uh, covers off and you only got six engines you drive with three cylinders? What would happen? That's what we're doing. We're only using 10%. And what does Jesus say? Cast your net to the right side. Let me show you something. Somebody tell me what page 1 Kings is on so these people can find it. 1 Kings chapter 6. Let me show you something. Just yell out if you find it. 6. Page, go to page 296. Let me show you something. You're the temple. It says in the Bible that you're God's temple. He dwells in you. Okay? Let me show you something. Uh, when the ancients said that, that kundalini, which starts at the sacrum, the base of the spine, it's an energy that rises in a cyclic rhythm. It rises in a winding rhythm up to the pineal gland of the brain. Now, let me show you something. First Kings chapter 6 and go to verse 8. The middle chamber... The middle chamber is the Holy of Holies. What does it say? The door for the middle chamber was in the right side of the house. Why did Jesus say, cast your net to the right side? Why did they put the door to the middle chamber in the right side of the house? They went up with winding stairs. The winding stairs, you ever see a picture of DNA, that winding pattern? The caduceus, that's exactly what it was. And into the middle chamber, which is the uh, right side, and out of the middle into the third, which is the third heaven, or the place of what they call air. We'll get that to another time. So anyhow, that basically covers for you the question of the two witnesses. I shall give power to my two witnesses. The two witnesses that are within you prophesy 1,260 days means identifies it as consciousness. It'll always come out as nine. There is another number, which is that point of perfection, which is the number 12, which works out to three, if, if you take one plus two or three. I want to show you something interesting about that, uh, using that same type of numerology. Go to page 736, and if you do, you'll find the book of uh, Daniel. Page 736, and Daniel chapter 12. And let's look at something. Daniel chapter 12 and verse 11. Okay? Now, what's it say? And from the time that the daily sacrifice shall be taken away. The daily sacrifice is when you, every day, go into meditation. Sacrificing what? Your thoughts. The only enemy you have in this world are your thoughts. They kill you, they make you sick, they rob you of your life, they get you mad at other people, they get other people mad at you. Everything that happens that is vile or good in this world starts first as a thought. 
everything. You can't do something. That's Adam and Eve. Adam is the earth. Adam is your mind. Eve is the life-giving spirit. That's the thought process. The serpent is your spine, representing the flesh. So when Eve, which is the thought process, is attracted to that which is the flesh, that which is the desires of the lower, when that happens and you decide, I'm going to do this, then Eve has devoured the fruit. Then after Eve has devoured the fruit, it is given to Adam, which means the physical, that which is the mind, that carries the deed out. So, in other words, when something happens, Adam has consumed the fruit. When you're thinking about it, Eve has consumed the fruit. Okay? And then what occurs is the realization that nothing can happen unless it first starts as a thought. That's why Eve always has to eat the fruit before Adam. There's no people as Adam and Eve. Never was. How can you have two English people living over there in the middle of Timbuktu? The first people, two people are English, Adam and Eve. How do you do? Pip, pip, and all that kind of thing. Hello. I think so. I got a Bible here. How do you do? God, oh, good. Tip, tip, pip. God, God's a great old fellow. How do you do? What the heck is this all about? And not only that, but you go to Jerusalem, and who are Jesus' friends? Peter, Paul, Mary, Phil, Tom. Oh, where do these guys come from? You never find one of them over there. It's like, what? Somebody changes it. These are symbols. They're talking about you. Adam is your physical body. Look, you see that word Adam? You know, out of Memphis, Egypt, the first man that was created way before the Bible, you know what his name was? Atom. Do you know what that is? Atom. Do you know this is Adam? Adam, it's the same thing. It's a nuclear plant down here. It's Adam is what it means. And when God took a rib out of Adam to make women, it has nothing to do with ripping a rib out of a man to make some lady. It means when you take an electron out of an atom, you procreate the energy. God is saying, the Bible is saying, that all life started by what? Splitting the atom. Why? What's wrong with that? Well, we can't have that. It makes sense. I'd much rather believe, it's much holy to believe. He laid this guy on the ground, put a little Novocaine in his gizzard, and ripped the air rib right out of his side, and made you, Judy Roscoe. <laughs> That's holy, right? Let's read Genesis. Oh, God, I ain't write the Bible. God's holy word. I love that. Can't take this. This makes too much sense. This might be. This is plausible. Get rid of that. It's plausible. I want to hear about that. Okay? Where were we? Daniel. <laughs> All right. Now watch. And from the time that the, your Daniel 12, verse 11. And from the time that the daily sacrifice shall be taken away. The daily sacrifice is meditation. The sacrifice is sacrificing your thoughts, your desires. You do that in meditation. Doesn't mean you give up eating cake or smoking cigarettes or whatever you do, because as soon as you get done meditating, you can run right up the stairs and take a puff or whatever you do. It, it'll come right back to you, just like that. But you sacrifice, and as you sacrifice, during that period of sacrifice, you energize the right hemisphere of the brain. You begin to pick up impulses there. And I'll tell you something, if you're being fair, you pick up the paper every day of the week, you turn on the television every day of the week, you'll find doctors and scientists and all kinds of people talking about this stuff. No matter where you turn, you'll find people talking about the right hemisphere of the brain, the creative hemisphere of the brain, thinking laterally instead of thinking vertically, okay? When it says that the time that the daily sacrifice shall be taken away, that means when you stop in meditation and the abomination that makes the desolation is set up. There are people in religion and Christianity who believe the abomination of desolation is some guy that's going to come into a temple in Israel that isn't made yet, that we're going to have to blow up the Muslim temple in order to put the Jewish temple there, and they're going to bring a pig in, a regular porker, and put it on the, on the altar and sacrifice. That's the abomination. That really, that's what, they, I'm that's what they believe. And they'll tell you that. What is the abomination of desolation? The abomination is the horror of desolation which means the horror of the right side being desolate. You're never there. And you think about it, how many of you have actually ever been there? Have you been to the right hemisphere? Because if not, you've left it desolate. And the abomination of desolation means it is a horror because the right hemisphere is desolate because you have spent your time in the left side. 
when Garden of Eden, where is Eden? Go to the first page of the Bible. Book of Genesis, it's on the first page. If you can't find the first page, then we've got to figure it out. It's, it's, uh, okay? Which one? Okay. Okay. And I'm just, I'm just trying to find it. Uh, okay, go to Genesis chapter 2, verse 8. Let me show you something. Genesis chapter 2, verse 8. And what's it say? And the Lord God planted a garden where? Eastward in Eden. Why eastward? Because when you look north, east is on the right side. He planted it on the right side. The Garden of Eden is the right hemisphere of your brain. It's the creative side. And you say, well, I don't know if I believe that. Well, want to try it. Go there and find what comes from the right side, the east side, the Eden side, as opposed to the left side. You surely know where the left side is. It's made of atomic bombs. It's made of drugs. It's made of rapes. It's made of stress and hate and guilt and fear and all of this crap that you live in the middle of it and say, oh, we're in the... You know, yesterday was Independence Day. Independence from what? Most people owe their guts to the banks, to the mortgage companies, to the IRS, in constant stress, three and four jobs trying to find. For what's independence? Freedom, where? Okay? So here it says in, De in Daniel 12, the time the sacrifice shall be taken away in the abomination, there shall be 1,290 days. One, two, nine. Okay, adds up to 12, which is perfection, which breaks down to 3. 1 plus 2 plus 9 equals 12. 1 plus 2 equals 3. I'm telling you how they did this in the ancient times in numerology, and that 3 means new life. This particular 3, which means new life, is a bad life, because now you've stopped meditating, you've stopped, you started resurrecting the desolation of the right side, and there's going to be a change in your life. It's going to be a negative change, but there's going to be a change. That's why Jesus was in the tomb three days, and... No, uh, Jonah was in the well three days, because three means new life. It means a change in life. So when you stop meditating and the abomination starts to make the right side desolate, there's going to be a change in your life and it's going to be negative. Look at the very next line. Blessed is he that waits meditation and comes to the 1,335 days. 8, 11, 12, 3. It's new. That, that's new life. That's exactly how the people of the East did it. You remember earlier when we showed you 666 equals 9, negative, 144 equals 9, positive. Here you have uh, 1,290 days, 1290 equals 3, negative, 1335 equals 3, positive. So it's saying that when you stop meditating, you set up a horror, a desolation on the right side, and your life is going to change and it's going to be negative. But when you are waiting, when you sit in meditation and you wait, you set up this 1335 or that new life, which is a positive time in your life. That's basically what's being said here. None of this stuff means what it says. None of it. Oh, I don't know. I can't believe that none of this means what it says. I had a guy that told me that one time. He says, let me tell you something. The way you're talking about this Bible symbolism, you're off the wall. I said, what? <laughs> here he was talking in symbolisms, telling me that there is no such thing. You're off the wall. This guy here, three sheets to the wind. Do you know what that means? We need first aid squad. Why? She shot her mouth off. <laughs> uh, how about you and me? We go out and shoot the bull. <laughs> Got a gun? We need a broom. Lovely Marge, spill the beans. <laughs> Do you know what I'm saying to you? Not one of those things means what it said, but you know exactly what it means. And you've got billions of these things. And if you start and think of all the things, oh, it's right on the nose. He's green with envy. I mean, think of all the different things that you say, kick the bucket, you know? And, 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 and think of all of the different things that you say when you talk in symbolism, and then you look at this thing and take it literally, even though the Bible says don't take it literally. Let me just, let me wrap this up by one last thing I wanted to show you. Okay, when we talk about the two witnesses, all right, the two witnesses that shall prophesy 1,260 days. Go to page 766. For the rest of you, look at the, bo uh, the book of Zechariah. Page 766, 
And I'll just show you this and then that's it. Okay. Zechariah chapter 4, you there? Verse 2. And he said to me, what do you see? And I said, I have looked and behold a candlestick. The candlestick all of gold. The candlestick is the spine, the human spine. And it is, it is changed into that conveyance of God. That's why it is gold. All of gold with a bowl on the top, which is that identifies itself as the pineal gland of the brain. And it's seven pipes thereon and seven pipes to the seven lamps which are on top thereof. And those seven represent the seven chakras, which you meditate and you open those seven seals and rise up the seven chakras to impact the pineal gland of the brain. And two olive trees by it. See verse 3? One upon the right side and one upon the left side thereof. Those two olive trees are the starting point of where we're at today at Smyrna. They're the two witnesses. One at the right side, one at the left side. And they represent that which is the pineal and pituitary gland of the brain. Those things which are feeding the lower have to be raised in order to feed the higher. Because if you allow them to stay at the point that they're at, they steal. They're thieves. They steal from you. They steal your joy by giving you thoughts. They steal your time by giving you thoughts. They steal your health by giving you thoughts because they're at the lower and they're unregenerated. They have to be raised. Quickly with me, go to page 807 and this will be the last one. 807 and look at the book of Matthew and if you look at Matthew chapter 27 okay, Matthew chapter 27 and verse 38 what does it say? Upon the time of Jesus' crucifixion there were two thieves crucified with him one on the right hand, one on the left. Those thieves, why are they called thieves? Because they steal from you. You are being robbed. I am being robbed of my health. You are being robbed of your health. You are being robbed of all of those things of your life because the two thieves are stealing. The two thieves must be crucified, and when they are raised up, they are no longer stealing, but they are together with the Christ in paradise, and that which has been all of the negativity and hurt and all of that which is of the lower turns into the renewal on the higher and the higher realms of consciousness. That's why that happens. Why you have to say, why were the two thieves there? Why was it one on the right? Why was it one on the left? Why does that match up with Zachariah of that which is the bowl and the seven chakras and the pineal gland and all this business? And you look at me, what the heck is he talking about? Seven chakras, the pineal gland, the right hemisphere, the brain, all this kind of a stuff. The ancient people taught, okay, that you have a pineal gland of the brain. The pineal gland of the brain is the single eye. You've seen a dot in the middle of the forehead of a, of a Hindu. Jesus Christ said in Matthew, come on, real quick, because we have to go. Matthew 6, hurry up. I want you to see it with your own face, because, quick, Matthew 6, are you with me? Hurry up, come on. What page is it on? 781, 781 Matthew 6, you there? Okay, look at verse 22. What does Jesus say? Come on, look at it, because you, if I tell you this, it means nothing. If you look at it, I want you to see there's an authority for saying this. The light of the body is the eye. If therefore thy eye be single, thy body will fill with light. That's the single eye. That's the third eye. That's the pineal gland of the brain. Will you look at me for a minute? It's the pineal gland of the brain. It's the pineal gland of the brain. Everybody in the universe knows it's the pineal gland of the brain except Christians because they don't tell you that because that's the seed of the soul. That's where you're going to turn on and become an independent thinker and you're not going to need to follow that mob anymore. It's the pineal gland of the brain, the pineal gland of the brain. Go back to Genesis 30. Somebody tell me what page it's on. Genesis chapter 30. Genesis chapter actually 32. Okay, what page is Genesis chapter 32 on? Okay, Genesis cha page 28, Genesis chapter 32, verse 30. I want you to read this. Jacob has been wrestling with himself. Jacob has been wrestling with life. Jacob finally sees God face to face. Are you ready? Genesis chapter th 32, verse 30. And Jacob called the name of the place Peniel. For I have seen God face to face. You can get a medical book out and they'll tell you from the 1940s they don't know what the, what the pineal gland of the brain is. This guy identified it six, seven, eight thousand years ago. What's it for? It's the third eye. It's the seat of the soul. When you practice the meditation, you light up that pineal gland of the brain. It opens the right hemisphere and you begin to understand the things of God. And it's in the book. And 
as they say, how do I know? The Bible tells me so. It's in the book. But if I show them, oh, no, I don't believe that stuff. I'm not allowed to believe in that stuff. Or they say, well, you know, this is a new age. This is Aquarius. Oh, I'm not allowed to believe in astrology. That's like people say, oh, no, yeah, I know it's going to be cold in February, but I'm not allowed to believe in February because my church doesn't allow me to talk about February, so we can't have any Februaries. It's an age. It's a change of things. Here, look, come here. Come here. I want to, what did I just say? I said, the pineal gland of the brain, the single eye, energizes by energy coming up the spine, going through the seven chakras, throwing open the right hemisphere of the brain. Here's the last one. Look at Revelation chapter 5. It's in your Bible. It's in the Bible. Huh? Look at it. Revelation chapter 5. What does it say? Quick. You there? Yeah. Pay, huh? Huh? Revelation chapter 5. And I saw in the, what hand? Right. right hand. Here we come back to the right hemisphere of the brain. Of him that sat on the throne, which is the higher mind. A book. This is the book of life. This is the last book of life. Let's describe it. It's a book written within. And on the, look at it. Backside. Sealed with seven seals. This isn't a Hindu book, is it? Because you're saying this is a Hindu Bible on it. See? So all you have to do is do what it says to do. And it's yours. The kingdom, the healings, the lifting up, the changing of the world. And so many people today are doing it, that's why you're seeing so many changes in the world. So many changes in the universe. And the greatest part about this, go out tonight, take a look up. Because there is Uranus chugging back in to claim the bride Gaia. That's what this is all about. You know, most people... Here, yesterday you knew what it was about yesterday, right? Fourth of July. Oh, da, 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 da. You get it every year. This is something you get once every 2,600 years. And it's happening right now while you're sitting here. And you know what? Nobody knows about it. See? Because once upon a time, Gaia, the Mother Earth, was married to Uranus. And they had children. And one child was named Saturn. Dun, 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 dun. Saturn equates to Satan. Saturn also is known as Cronus, time. And what he did, he took a sickle and castrated Uranus. <sniffs> snip, snip. What that meant was no longer could God, Uranus, have his seed come into you. Why? Because you were too consumed with time. You can't even spend. You know how many? You probably spent yesterday thinking about today. You're probably spending today thinking about tomorrow. Or you thought about last week. Oh, what's going to happen next week? Oh, let's go out somewhere. And you go to a movie or a concert, and when you're sitting in the movie or a concert, what do you do? You'll be thinking about it next week. What's going to happen? Oh, my God, I don't know what's going to happen. Or what did happen? Or what's so-and-so going to say? Because time robs you of everything that you ever have in your life. You can never enjoy the present, see? So Uranus was castrated. The seed could not come in. And Gaia, Mother Earth, was separated from Father. And then out of the deep ocean, which is God's truth, came Venus, love, and with the help of the Cyclops, which is the single eye, overthrew Saturn and put Uranus back in control. And Uranus is coming back right now. I mean, literally, you can go to the planetarium and see it. Uranus is coming back and taking charge in this new age. And that's why all the changes, that's why the end of the Soviet Union, that's why the South Africa, that's why the chaos, that's why there's so much chaos in your life, that's why there's so much chaos in neighbors' lives and confusion all over the place, because Uranus is taking over and driving Jupiter. Jupiter was the planet of wealth, Jupiter is the planet of desire, Jupiter is the planet of the bankers, Jupiter is the pl planet of all that which is money, and Jupiter is being driven out of the sky. The money changers are being driven out of the temple by that which is Uranus. And Uranus, which is now exercising its authority and control over the minds of people, something unique about it. Not only is it spirit, it's the only planet that spins in a counterclockwise direction. All the rest of them go like that. Uranus goes like that. And Uranus is known by the ancients of that, which turns everything upside down. And the poor people who have been oppressed, the hurt people who have money taken them by the religions and the systems of this world, are going to have it returned. So if you're in that category, put your hand out and wait, because you're going to get it back. And you're going to see all of these institutions crumble to the ground like they're doing all over the world. And it, nothing can stop it. Because Uranus is coming back to claim his bride. And the feminine principle of God is being reunited that was ripped and robbed and taken away by the, by the religions. Mother God is coming back to take Father God's hand. This is homecoming. This is a great time. But you've got to get into it. Get back to the earth. Take all your hunting guns and all that crap. Throw them away. I'm going to go in and hunt, go in with cameras and, and, and love the animals and love the earth and love the trees and the skies. Become one with it 
and understand the Christ and the God who dwells, dwells inside of you. And concentrate in your meditation, open the right door to the right hemisphere of the brain, and then be lifted up into the higher realms of consciousness and become one in harmony with this great age of Aquarius. What did Jesus Christ say? When you see the man with the pitcher of water, Aquarius, enter into the house, go to the upper room. I'll meet you there. How many have failed to keep that rendezvous? But you know what? The good part, he's still there. He's waiting for you. Thank you very much for sharing this time. When you're done with this tape, <coughs> uh, send it on to the next person as fast as you can. Send the card back to Mary. There's a route sheet in your tape box. Put that in the box so the next person will know where to send their tape. And uh, Joan will come on and tell you about the needs that we have to take care of all the expenses. We depend on you. Thank you very much. We'll see you back. Family.